I'm going to start the discussion of eosinophilic esophagitis with a, an actual case. This is a 26-year-old man who presents with intermittent dysphagia to solids only since the age of 15. He has had two past episodes of food impaction. He denies heartburn. He has no acid regurgitation and no past ingestion of any corrosive agent. You obtain an x-ray and it shows this rippled esophagus, as well as I can describe it, with a narrow caliber. And those ripples are created by subtle esophageal rings. Next, you obtain an endoscopy and you see the succession of concentric firm rings throughout the entire esophagus. So your observation is that the esophagus is narrow, that there are multiple rings. You take multiple biopsies and you go ahead and dilate the esophagus using savory dilators from 12 to 15 millimeters. And post dilation, you take a look. Uh, on the left, you have the, the uh, guide wire still in place. And on the right, after dilation, you notice that you have produced what we would call a superficial laceration or a tear. The patient goes to the recovery area and pretty soon the nurses call you to tell you that he has developed severe chest pain. You proceed to have chest pain yourself because you're worried about perforation and you send the patient to x-ray. Fortunately, a gastrographic swallow shows no perforation. So this is a typical case of what I would refer to as a florid case of eosinophilic esophagitis, which I will refer to from here on as EOE, because it's uh, easier to pronounce. So what's the definition of EOE? The most accepted definition by con consensus now is that it's a chronic immune-mediated disorder of the esophagus with esophageal symptoms and intense esophageal eosinophilia defined as 15 or more eosinophils per high power field in the absence of other causes of eosinophilia. Now, it's a lengthy uh, definition, and, and it has at least three major components. It's immune-mediated, it has esophageal symptoms, and we won't define them any further because they vary from patient to patient, and there is a histologic component to it, a certain number of eosinophils, but other causes of eosinophilia have been ruled out. Why is that? Because there are, as the next slide shows, multiple causes for eosinophilia. Now, I will dispense with parasites and fungi and IBD because they occur in a clinical context in which you're not going to be thinking of, a, of EOE. Really, the differential diagnosis is going to concentrate mostly on two, GERD and EOE. Now, occasionally, uh, particularly in children, the entity of uh, uh, Eosinophilic gastroenteritis will come up, but again, this is in the context of diarrhea, abdominal pain, other symptoms. And so for practical purposes, we're going to concentrate on the relationship between GERD and EOE. Now, what's the prevalence of the disease? Unf uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you latest figures because this prevalence is changing with time, as the disease seems to be more of a recent development. Uh, if you talk to practitioners who were around 20 or 25 years ago, they would tell you that they didn't even know about the condition back then. And we don't know why this is, although there are theories about why this is occurring more frequently. Anyway, for what it's worth, up to four or five years ago, the prevalence in Sweden was about 1% in adults. And in the U.S., it's, it's reported in about 3 to 4% of patients undergoing EGD for GERD, and in 7 to 9% of patients of children with histologic esophagitis. Now, to show you that the prevalence is increasing, this is a slide from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia up to 2003, showing that in 94, there were a couple of cases, and then year after year, the number have continued to increase, and by the way, has continued to increase since then. The prevalence, uh, when you look now at, the, at patients with EOE, it's mostly prevalent in, in males. About 70 to 80% of cases are going to occur in males. 
mainly on non-Hispanic whites, so it's much rarer in, in blacks and other ethnic groups, and the mean age about 30. So your typical case is going to be a young male. However, the the, obviously the disease can occur in any age group, and you should always keep it in mind. Now, what's the pathogenesis? Well, it's probably an allergic component. We had a question mark before, but as I said now, an immune-mediated mechanism is part of the definition anyway. Because in children, it's often associated with asthma, rhinitis, and eczema in more than 50% of patients. And when you do diet restriction or elimination in children, it seems to be extremely effective to the tune of 98%. In adults, the connection is not as impressive. You do find atopia in 78%, but since hay fever is so frequent, for instance, it's hard to connect it with EOE. On the other hand, there is an IgE for food allergen in 82% of patients. So the connection with allergy or Im immune-mediated mechanism seems to be quite strong. <clears throat> and EOE has been referred by some as asthma of the esophagus. And on this slide, what you will see is that an allergen, whether airborne, coming through the nose, or a food more likely coming through the mouth, gets to the esophagus, and when it gets there, it produces a reaction. An a helper T cell will produce uh, interleukin and other uh, uh, components, which will recruit eosinophils to the area. The eosinophils congregate, therefore the infiltration you observe on biopsy, and in time, eosinophils are going to create fibrosis and leads to rings. So this is how today the pathogenesis is thought to occur in EOE. So it's an allergic disease, most likely to a food. And some people think that the prevalence has increased because we are, our resistance to, to allergens has decreased in time because we maybe uh, uh, raise our children too much of a, uh, in a bubble and eating from uh, the floor, which I did as a kid, is now an absolute no-no. And maybe that's the result of this. And the use of antibiotics and other components. So what's the possible relation of GERD and EOE? Well, there are four possibilities. One is that GERD and EOE coexist and they're unrelated. Secondly, uh, could be that GERD causes mild eosinophilia. And we know that. We know that if you biopsy lots of patients with uh, with GERD, you will find some infiltration of eosinophils, at least in the distal esophagus. The third possibility is that EOE is causing GERD because it alters motility and then favors the entry of acid in the esophagus. And finally, it's possible that GERD causes EOE by injuring the mucosa, leading to epithelial permeability and then the recruitment of immune cells. Whatever it is, the clinical features of the disease are, again, as we said, male predominance. In children, they will, comp they will present with heartburn, but also with vomiting and with dysphagia. In adults, the main diagnosis is dysphagia and a history of food impaction. Now, the diagnosis of EOE may be made by radiology, endoscopy, biopsy, and manometry and pH testing. So let me say a word about each of those. As I've already showed in the case I presented initially, when you obtain an X-ray, you may find multiple rings present here, mostly on the top of the picture in the proximal esophagus. But if you pay attention carefully, you will see that there are ripples actually throughout the entire esophagus. And this is a close-up of the proximal esophagus, showing that those rings are actually caused stricture. There is a difference in the diameter of the esophagus above them and at their level. And you can imagine why dysphagia will occur at that point. So on endoscopy, these are the various terms you will see reported. Feline esophagus, because apparently the, the esophagus of EOE is very reminiscent of the esophagus of the cat. Now, you are not used to endoscope cats, so it's probably not very important. But you will notice concentric multiple rings, corrugations, furrows, there will be granularity. Sometimes it's been referred to as crab paper because of the ripples. But keep in mind that in the early stages of the disease, at least, the esophagus, esophageal mucosa may be entirely normal. So in case of 
a high index of suspicion for the disease, biopsies are a must. This is a picture of concentric rings, again, a picture of longitudinal furrows. Here you have to look from up down and you can see that there are linear uh, uh, deformities occurring throughout the esophagus beside the concentric rings, which are, by the way, not as marked as the previous case. And this is why you must take biopsies. Biopsies might be taken proximally and distally because in GERD, the, as the eosinophils are going to be located mostly in the distal part. The eosinophil uh, count should be 15 or more. This is the consensus now. You may find microabscesses, but gastric and duodenal biopsies are not necessary. You will see this recommendation, but all the guidelines say that they are not necessary to obtain. How about esophageal manometry and pH testing? There are here three studies. Uh, 19 patient, 12 patient, 26 patient. And while you can see a smattering of abnormal motility in a small number of patients, two of 16, one of 12, one of 23, and an abnormality of pH on pH study in a few patients, the abnormalities are really not significant and there is no recommendation to obtain manometry or pH testing in patients with EOE unless you are conducting a clinical study or you are after to prove a point or another. How about the management of EOE? There are several things available to us. We either dilate the esophagus or we do elimination diet, trying to get away the allergens. Elemental diets, which are very hard to obtain and are done in kids with, with very severe disease. Proton pump inhibitors, topical corticosteroids, systemic corticosteroids, and butesonide. Let me say a word about each of those. Dilations are significantly helpful in EOE. They're effective for the relief of dysphagia, and frankly, I consider them first line of treatment. Now, because of the risk of laceration and perforation, which is distinctly more so because of the stiffness of the esophagus, there is reluctance in many endoscopies to do a dilation. But frankly, if it's you proceed with caution, you use guided bougie, no blind Maloney insertion, and you start with a small size, and you stop when you see blood on the dilator, and you rather use repeat incremental dilation rather than trying to be too aggressive in one sitting, the procedure is quite safe, and we should not deny it to the patient. <clears throat> well, this is a study trying food elimination based on skin testing. Patients have been uh, tested and uh, the, the offending foods have been uh, identified. And if you can see in blue after or and green after, uh, sorry, blue before and green after, the number of eosinophils per high pyophil decreases markedly after treatment, GERD symptoms go away and dysphagia goes away. Well, how about PPI? They are used and the recommendation is to use them in all patients. Why? Because GERD and EOE, in the early stage of EOE at least, are hard to distinguish. So you can rule out GERD if the patient gets suddenly better. You, there is also increasing recognition of a PPI-responsive EOE condition. And if you can treat that without any further uh, attempt, that would be good. And finally, because patients do report symptom relief. So there is sense and the recommendation is to start with one PPI daily in all patients. And if they get better, you do not need to, to do anything further. Fluticazone used locally, just copied on the treatment of asthma, has been used as early as 2007. This is the first study from the Mayo Clinic taking 21 patients, 17 of whom were male, with an age range of 28 to 55. At that time, the definition of the disease was 20 eosinophils or more, so all of them had that. They were given a six-week course of fluticasone, and 100% were better for four months or longer, although additional treatment was needed in four patients. And there's another study, again, uh, from, a, from uh, another center, using uh, 26 patients, 18 of whom were male. Uh, the definition now is 15 eosinophils. All 19 got better after uh, four weeks of treatment, but in 14 of 19, the, the disease recurred after three months. And there is a 
uh, about one of the rare randomized controlled trials happens to be in children comparing fluticasone to placebo. And the primary outcome here was a reduction on eosinophil infiltration. And it, as you can see, significantly different for fluticasone. How do we use the aerosol is important because you want the steroids to reach the esophageal mucosa, not the respiratory tree. So we tell patient to take four puffs of 220 micrograms per puff with the inhaler for six weeks after lunch and dinner, not to use a spacer, shake the inhaler, take a deep breath, and at the maximum of expiration, depress the inhaler and swallow the puff. Rinse the mouth after you're done and spit the water out and take no drinks or, or water and or food for three hours so you do not wash the fluticasone from the esophagus. Now, how about oral systemic corticosteroids? There are very few studies, uh, controlled studies, but this is one of them. 20 pediatric patients who did not respond to PPI alone, who had 15 eosinophil per high power field, and were given 1.5 milligram per kilo of methylprednisolone twice a day for four weeks. There was a significant reduction in, of symptoms in all, and a significant reduction in eosinophil count in all. And after one year of follow-up, 50% remained asymptomatic. Well, how about butesonide? Why the interest in butesonide? Because uh, there is less absorption and presumably less systemic effect than other corticosteroids. So this is a well-designed study using the butesonide in a viscous solution, 1 to 2 milligrams per day compared to placebo. 15 patients versus 9 patients, the histologic response in the treatment arm is 87% compared to 0% in the placebo arm. And the score improvement is significant in the treatment arm and minimal in the placebo arm. Now, butesonide in adults, one other study comparing suspension, 2 mg per day to placebo, 18 patients in each arm of the study, histologic response in all patients treated, none of the placebo patients. 13 patients improved dysphagia, 4 did not improve. Now, the problem with butosanide, if you want to use it, is there is no ready solution. So you need the cooperation of your local pharmacist or your hospital pharmacist to prepare the solution to, to do that. Now, the other problem with use of any of these corticosteroids is that there is no study showing how long the effect of steroid is, how long you should continue to use it. And this is why uh, I reserve it really as a last resort, because once you use it, and you have to use it again and again, particularly since you're dealing with young patients, you have to start worrying about the systemic side effects of the drug. So from a practical standpoint, what is my approach to eosinophilic esophagitis? You have to suspect the diagnosis in young patients and in any patient with unexplained dysphagia. Now, having said that, this is not a license to biopsy every patient with any chest pain. Unfortunately, there is tendency now to biopsy everybody looking for EOE. I think you have to have a certain index of suspicion because otherwise you're going to get stuck with an eosinophilia which may or may not be clinically relevant and embark on a treatment which may carry side effects. You should obtain proximal and distal biopsies and your pathologist should report the results separately. Manometry, pH testing, endoscopic ultrasound to measure the thickness of the esophageal wall are not necessary. And the management in adults, I think, should be starting with PPIs, then to dilation, using it as often as needed. Inhaled steroids next. Allergy evaluation in adults is so-so. We have sent all our patients to allergy evaluations and frankly, it hasn't been much help because the correlation that you can see in children between allergy picked up by skin testing and relief of symptoms is not significant. Uh, whereas in children, really the first sign of treatment ought to be diet elimination, better uh, identified by skin testing than by trial and error, inhaled steroids in next, and uh, PPI uh, probably in all cases. Thank you.